folks. I'd like to welcome all the. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome all the educators and historians and troublemakers and everyone in between to the uh, Walkertown Area Historical Society. And our, uh, we are delighted to have our speaker here today. And Mr. Baird will introduce Mr. Bachelor in just a moment. But before we do that, I have a few announcements. Uh, one, uh, the Walkertown Area Historical Site will have its open house the first Monday from 2 to 5. And it'll be next April, uh, April the 3rd. And that's welcome, everyone's welcome to that. Uh, we have our board meetings the second Tuesday of every month at 5.30 at the Walkertown Area Historical Society Center. That is 3058 Church Street. And the next board meeting is April 11th. If you don't know where it's at, it's the Red Roof Building, almost a uh, just a little way down the street, you can almost see it from here. Uh, we have our general meetings at the library on the third Tuesday of every month, and an extra program on May 16th. Now here's a, a very exciting event we have coming up. It is the Slave Dwelling Project is coming to Walkertown. Uh, Mr. Joe McGill and Ms. Prinny Anderson, who is the fourth great-granddaughter of Thomas Jefferson and his wife, uh, are both coming to Walkertown. What the Slave Dwelling Project does is they tour the South, sleeping in still existing slave cabins. Uh, Mr. McGill will be giving two or three free lectures to the community on uh, slavery in this area, the, the life of the slaves, and it should be a very <coughs> exciting event. On Saturday, uh, Mount Pleasant Night Methodist Church on Old Walkertown Road will be hosting an event where he and Ms. Anderson will be speaking at and they will provide a free barbecue dinner afterwards. So y'all want to be there for that. Also, please make sure your cell phones are turned off. And uh, please support uh, WAS by joining and renewing your membership. Uh, Mr. Morris is back here to collect your dues. And uh, Mrs. Bobby is watching his pockets. <laughs> and a <mic> blow. <laughs> and we're also looking for volunteers for the litter pickup on uh, the 24th of this month. Uh, so if uh, you're willing to volunteer for this uh, good cause, also talk to Mr. Morris. Uh, Mr. Baird, would you like to introduce our speaker? Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Welcome to our March meeting. Our speaker tonight is John Batchelor. Uh, he is a native of Greensboro. He has taught and worked for over 30 years in the North Carolina, is it on for um, He served as a school, school superintendent in several counties, I think, and has been a consultant for development and improvement of education at uh, the Success for All Foundation and for the Center for Data Driven Reform at Johns Hopkins. He writes a lot. He has a blog, if you'll look up John uh, Bachelor blog, I think it is, dot com. Very interesting, restaurant reviews, and lots of other stuff. He has a couple of books on uh, chefs of North Carolina. John, welcome. He's going to speak on race and education in North Carolina. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I have been to this library on a couple of occasions in the past. I appreciate being invited back. Uh, most people don't invite me back after I've been one time, so this is, this is really gratifying. Uh, I tell people that researching and writing those books about uh, eating and drinking in restaurants and traveling in North Carolina require a lot of eating and drinking. Researching and writing this book were just about drove me to drink. So there's kind of a reciprocal relationship. Uh, my writing has taken two, two parallel lines, I guess. Uh, I was a teacher in the Guilford County Schools and got interested and was fortunate to be offered the restaurant review column for the Greensboro newspaper, and I've been doing that over 35 years. But as an outgrowth of my teaching, I began writing uh, about teaching and history, and I was author or co-author of several uh, textbooks, which I'm proud to say became bestsellers, as well as teaching materials, and then over time, uh, some academic works as well. This one was published by Louisiana State University Press, uh, and although it is an academic work with lots of footnotes, uh, it's an easy read. If you want to know how I figured stuff out, 
go to the footnotes. If you want to just read a good book, it's an easy read. Uh, I, can, I can read this book in less than a day. The text is about 145, 150 pages. Uh, the footnotes are about 120 pages. So you don't have to read the footnotes, but there's some stuff in there that's interesting if you want to know how I knew what I was saying. Or if you think that maybe he didn't know what he was talking about, uh, you, know, you can look at the footnotes and I'll, I think I've tried to prove it to you. When you look at the history of education in North Carolina, you start out with the period between the Constitution of 1776 and the Civil War. The Constitution provided for a system of public schools, but the legislature never appropriated any money for public schools. So although they existed in law, they didn't exist in fact, except to the extent that families from time to time would get together and build a log cabin and go hire a teacher. Uh, I wrote that story in a uh, history of the Guilford County Schools, and that history is replicated throughout North Carolina. So the original schools, although they were technically public schools, were actually started by families, and they only taught the kids of the families that paid for the teacher. Uh, my students, when I explained that to them, part of the deal was the teacher would live in your house and you'd have to feed him, and my kids would say, well, that'd be pretty much of a losing proposition if you were the teacher, the only way we'd have to feed you. Um, so the legislature didn't appropriate any money for over 50 years. They became concerned that, although certainly they were not providing for the education of black children, of the children of slaves, they got worried that somebody, such as Quakers, might go out and teach slave children or slaves to read and write. So in 1831, a report from the, in the General Assembly stated, one source of great evil which suggests itself is the teaching of slaves to read and write, thereby affording them facilities of intelligence and communication inconsistent with their condition, destructive of their contentment and happiness, and dangerous to the community. So the General Assembly in that session made teaching slaves of any age a crime. After the Civil War, the new Constitution directed the General Assembly to provide a system, create a system of public schools supported by taxes. But a lot of the support for the schools came from private sources. The federal government, the Freedmen's Bureau, which came down and set up a kind of almost a government in the South, uh, separate and independent from the legislatures that the states themselves had established, they set up and supported and managed a system of schools, and then several private funds paid for by northern philanthropists also paid for uh, the provision of education in the South. And during this period, it surprised me to find, when I began studying the enrollment and term statistics in the documents, that in the period from during Reconstruction, black children in at least in cities in North Carolina, were provided more days and a better education than white children because of the way the Freedmen's Bureau set things up. In 1877, conservative Democrats regained power, part of the Great Compromise of 1877, which I'm sure you've studied in your classes. Uh, and when the conservative Democrats regained power, they took back control from the Republican government. The Freedmen's Bureau was abolished or exited the South, and control of Southern governments was returned to Southern legislatures. An amendment to the Constitution required that black and white children be provided with public schools, but they had to be separate. The schools for the white children made very little progress during this period of time and the schools that had been provided to black children dramatically decreased in terms of the number and percentage of children enrolled and for the term. So under democratic rule for the, for the last 25 years of the 19th century, the quality of education for all children in North Carolina seriously declined and for black children severely declined. Taxation during this period by the, under the Constitution could only be levied for necessary purposes. 
And so I narrate and analyze a series of cases that appeared to the, before the North Carolina Supreme Court trying to arrive at a definition of what is a necessary purpose. The court eventually ruled that limits on taxation could not exceed legislated mandates because public schools were not a necessary purpose. Although laws requiring appropriations to round up and keep pigs off the streets were necessary. <laughs> kind of lets you know where the priorities were. In 1899, a new constitutional amendment implemented a literacy test for voting. And that literacy test gave rise to what's now known as the grandfather clause, effectively disenfranchising blacks. The way the law read, if your grandfather had voted, then you could vote without passing the literacy test. Therefore, illiterate whites could vote, but blacks, by and large, could not vote at all, regardless of ability to pass a literacy test because of the way these tests were administered. So, as of 1900, a system of severe restriction has been reinstituted. Not slavery, but severe restriction. The legal doctrine that governed the structure of education with regard to race from 1896, the latter part of the 19th century, up through the 1950s was, and this is a quote from the law, separate but equal. The law all over the South required that separate schools be maintained for black and white children, but that the schools must be equal and no advantage based on race could be provided. In fact, and, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a minute, this doctrine was embodied in not only legislation, but eventually in a United States Supreme Court decision, Plessy versus Ferguson. That case was argued by Albion Tourget, a white carpetbagger who lived in Greensboro and was a judge during Reconstruction. And the court noted uh, in the case that Tourget was of seven-eighths uh, white descent. But by law, if you had any black ancestors, you were black. That was the law. And there's another series of cases that I analyzed where courts repeatedly try to figure out what's the legal definition of white, what's the legal definition of black. And they go through a number of rather torturous exercises. And I'll show you a little bit in a minute. So separate but equal was the law all the way to the Supreme Court. And in another case a few years later, that doctrine was applied to education. So if race is the definer for separate schools, how were school administrators supposed to determine who was black, who was white? In 1889, the North Carolina legislature passed a law that anyone who had a black ancestor within three generations was black. In 1903, the law was changed to read, quote, any child with Negro blood or what is known as Croatan Indian blood in his veins, however remote, cannot attend white schools. We now know, of course, that that definition is medically preposterous, but you find repeatedly in the law the use of blood, quote unquote, as the definer, even though there is no such thing as black or white blood. In Medlin versus, Medlin versus the County Board of Education, the court looked at procedures to determine a child's race. And at the trial court level, the, the, the school administrators had refused to allow this child to enroll in a white school. And the trial court brought the child into the courtroom and had him stand in front of the jury. And the judge asked the jury, what is he? Well, that case went all the way to the North Carolina Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court's decision read, whenever the race of a child has been determined, quote, by a jury of 12 white men, there can be little doubt of the correctness of their conclusion. That is a direct quotation from the Supreme Court decision. I cannot make these things up. The schools were separate. And what I show in the book is that separate was meticulously maintained, but never equal by any criterion that you can imagine. As a school administrator, 
Uh, I know how the records are kept. I knew what reports to look up because I had to fill them out every year uh, for 15 uh, plus years. So when I started looking at the records of enrollment, attendance, the nature of the buildings, I was able to compile a number of tables that showed just for example that school terms were equal for black and white schools around 1900, but by the 1930s and 40s, blacks were provided 20 fewer days than whites. By 1950, the terms have been equalized again, sort of. When I looked at the nature of the school buildings themselves, I found that these statistics show the value of black schools showed that they were basically, at least in the rural areas, one-room schoolhouses, log cabins, where one teacher taught all kids all ages, as opposed to city schools that had implemented what was termed graded schools. And a graded school, of which Winston-Salem was one of the first and biggest and most prominent, were considered to be elite because not all children had to be taught by the same teacher. Kids could be in the third grade because of their age, and those children would be taught at a certain level, and fourth graders who were a year older could be taught at a more advanced level by uh, another teacher. But what I found was there was a much greater discrepancy between or uh, from city schools versus county schools. Because starting in the 1870s, given this law that I told you about a few minutes ago, where there was a cap on taxation, cities began to pass legislation, have the General Assembly pass legislation, making the city limits coterminous with a school district so that there became, throughout the state, city school districts inside county school districts. At one point, there were several hundred school districts in North Carolina. But throughout the state, the county districts had schools that were operated for half the number of years as the city schools were, and in buildings that were a half to a fourth the quality, the size, without grades compared to the city. And this turned out to be true of both black and white schools. So what I found, much to my surprise, was black city schools had a term that was usually double the length as white county schools in buildings that were double, triple, ten times better than county white buildings. But within those patterns, the black schools were always relegated to a status of inferiority. So there's a number of different layers of inequality that I found based not only on race, but also on geography. Teacher salaries were lower for black teachers. Efforts were made to equalize black and white teacher pay. But that was only done in the 1940s after the state took over the public school system in the Depression. And at one point in the 1950s and 60s, when lawsuits were underway, the state bragged about our valiant effort without any legal challenge whatsoever to equalize black and white teacher salaries. Of course, what they didn't say was there were lawsuits underway in a half a dozen states, and all of them, the leaders of North Carolina were lawyers, and they all knew about these lawsuits, and they knew that they were being lost as soon as the courts heard them. So they basically got a step or two ahead of the, the litigation. The legacy of Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal, can be summed up in a quotation from former federal judge Leon Higginbotham. Many more millions of African Americans were denied the benefits of first class citizenship by the Supreme Court's opinions in Plessy versus Ferguson and other related cases than by all the machinations of the Ku Klux Klan. And I include that as a summary point to kind of transition to the 1950s. Because one of the points that I want to make is, I think we make a mistake if we focus on the extremes, the violence, the, the Ku Klux Klan. They were there, they were important, they were malevolent, they were always dangerous, 
but they weren't really what determined the nature of education, and they weren't responsible for, for discrimination. They were a symptom, not a cause. It was the legal system. It was the law that was responsible for the discrimination. The primary impetus for change, as far as school desegregation is concerned, is lawsuits. If you look at the Civil Rights Movement and what developed in the 1960s and 70s, what you see is a grassroots effort uh, where, at, at, in, throughout towns and cities and localities all over the United States, uh, black citizens, in a lot of cases, with uh, help and support from some whites, especially uh, affiliated with certain religious groups, uh, Quakers, for example, Catholics, uh, they, they come to mind, especially Jews. They took direct action in the form of demonstrations that leaders realized had the capacity to bring the state, the nation, to a standstill. An accommodation had to be made. That's a grassroots effort. That's not what happened with school desegregation. School desegregation came about because of lawsuits, not because of direct action from the civil rights movement or demonstrations. And these lawsuits were filed consistently in the name of local individuals, because you can't file a hypothetical lawsuit. It has to be a real person who really fits the status of the grievance. These lawsuits were filed by attorneys who uh, were, were employed by, and in a lot of cases they never got paid, it was, it was uh, uh, pro bono work, but they worked for or through the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which was founded in 1909 for the express purpose of resisting and finding ways to challenge separate but equal and other discriminatory legislation. They initially filed lawsuits challenging higher education arrangements, especially graduate, law schools, medical, professional schools. The reason they took that route was great lawyering. Southern states didn't provide any medical schools, any law schools, any graduate or professional schools for blacks. Therefore, you can't claim it's equal if it doesn't exist. So they won these cases. And this series of cases eventually reached culmination in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, where the Supreme Court of the United States eventually overturned Leslie versus Ferguson from 1896 and declared that separate is inherently unequal and has no place in the design of a public school system. The key term in Brown versus Board of Education that people didn't understand at the time, they had, the lawyers had to work on this, was a phrase, desegregation must proceed with, quote, all deliberate speed. What does that mean? Deliberate and speed. Those are mutually contradictory terms. Well, what could they mean? And the answer is that phrase was lifted from litigation between the state of Virginia and the state of West Virginia, where when West Virginia seceded from Virginia during the Civil War, the Supreme Court ruled that West Virginia had to pay an indemnity to Virginia for the territory lost and they had to cough up the money with all deliberate speed. Which is another way of saying, whenever you get around to it, we're not going to tell you when, but you got to do it sometime. And that's basically what the language meant. So the message that the court is sending is, we realize, and they said in the decision, we realize how difficult this is going to be. So we're telling you, you got to change but we're not going to put a deadline on you now. And as a matter of fact, they told the southern states, we want you to come back in a year and you tell us what you can do and what sort of remedy you think is appropriate. So this was a very uh, unanimous but very difficult 
tenuous decision for the Supreme Court to reach. They include the phrase, the decision presents problems of considerable complexity. Who would have imagined it could be so complex? Well, there were six million children assigned to schools in the South. And if you've got to come up with a reassignment program for six million kids, that's complex. So a year later, the states went back to the Supreme Court, presented their arguments about appropriate remedy, and steps began to be put in place to proceed with all deliberate speed. Still no deadlines. Well, how does this fit into the context of North Carolina history? North Carolina, for the first half of the 20th century, was widely regarded, almost universally regarded, as a bellwether state for education, law, race relations, a moderate state, a state governed by lawyers, a state governed under the rule of law, uh, a remarkably clean government state uh, with an absence of the type of corruption that appeared in lots of other places that must remain nameless to protect the guilty. <coughs> so North Carolina, in this image of moderation, actually kind of, there's a, there's a balance here. On the one hand, there was a large and active Ku Klux Klan, but not one that dominated government, not one that engaged in a lot of night riding uh, and, and lynching and the sort of things that went on in the Deep South. They were there. They were dangerous, but not at the level of, for example, Alabama and Mississippi, South Carolina, Georgia, Louisiana. Voting requirements in North Carolina North Carolina's kind of in the mid-range. You know, they had the uh, literacy test in place. The actual participation for voting wasn't the worst in the South, but it was nowhere near the best, kind of in the middle. That's not moderate. That's just mediocre, middling. North Carolina had a number of other political qualities that made it appear to be progressive with regard to race and other issues. For example, in 1948, Carr Scott was elected governor. Well, he was the most liberal candidate ever elected governor in North Carolina, from Alamance County, right down the road. Uh, I used to be assistant superintendent of the Alamance County Schools, and I knew the Scott family and the Scott farm in that area. Uh, Carr Scott appointed the first black to the State Board of Education and the first female to a Superior Court bench. And these were groundbreaking appointments at the time. In 1950, North Carolina, one of North Carolina's senators died in office, and Scott appointed Frank Porter Graham to replace him. Now, Frank Porter Graham is a seminal figure in North Carolina history. He was the president of the University of North Carolina. He was probably, he was regarded as the best known liberal in North Carolina. Uh, he had been a uh, United Nations mediator, uh, he had served in several New Deal agencies, uh, very, very prominent with an international res reputation. Uh, he had been on the Civil Rights Commission as well. Then he had to run for his own term. Notice he was appointed, not elected. When he ran for his own term, he led the ticket in the primary, Democratic primary of 1950. But nobody thought he could be beaten. There were three candidates. But then one of the higher education cases leading up to Brown versus Board of Education was announced during this campaign, after the primary, but before the deadline for a runoff to be requested. And this, this case alarmed a lot of people in the South who thought they could see where this was going. And so race jumps to the forefront as an issue. It pretty much hadn't even been discussed up until this time. And it was brought to the forefront by a young radio commentator, reporter, named Jesse Helms, a very young man, who went to Willis Smith, a Raleigh attorney, the runner-up in the primary, a very prominent attorney, former Speaker of the State House of Representatives, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of Duke University, a very prominent individual, and 
Jesse actually led a demonstration and camped out in Willis Smith's front yard. And Willis Smith asked for a runoff right at the deadline. And during that campaign, that campaign became the dirtiest in North Carolina history. Uh, flyers all over the state, the headline was white people wake up and I'm not going to go beyond that. You know where the rest of this goes. It was a dirty, dirty, difficult campaign. And Smith won. Well, why? How does this fit into the context of culture and politics and law in North Carolina? Brown versus Board of Education was one of the most important stimuli for the development of the discipline of sociology and public opinion polling and studying of what people think, what they believe. And a team of researchers from Princeton University led by a professor named Elvin Tumen came to North Carolina to try to ascertain to what extent is school desegregation, to what extent is a change in race going to be possible in the South. And their study, when it was released, found the following. White people in North Carolina in the 1950s believed in almost every category you can imagine in white superiority. And they were willing to do about anything necessary when asked to maintain segregation and, and white superiority. Although not by any means a majority, 25% said they would favor using force if necessary to preserve segregation. Almost half said they would favor closing the public school system altogether rather than desegregating. So the tenor of the times is clear. William B. Umstead succeeded Carr Scott and William Umstead was uh, elected in 1952. Umstead is an interesting character. He was closely associated with the conservative wing of the Democratic Party. He had based his campaign in the past uh, for office on strong support for segregation. Uh, but when, he, when the Brown decision was handed down, he took a step back, he brought his closest advisors in, all of whom were, were attorneys, no, a number of whom were associated with the University of North Carolina, especially the Institute of Government. And he, he said, what, what, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to react? Now, I'm going to argue that since the Civil War, this is the most difficult situation. I'm going to take it back. There are a few genuine periods of existential crisis in American history. The Civil War is one. The Great Depression is another. I think this is the third. Historians can legitimately argue a couple of other points in time that were very, very difficult, but this is really tough. It would have been extremely difficult for anybody. But Governor Umstead was afraid he had a heart attack two days after he was inaugurated. And he spent his entire administration either bedridden or hospitalized or under a doctor's care. And he died uh, about 18 months after taking office. But he appointed a committee and asked them to provide advice. The committee that he appointed was biracial, included uh, three blacks, several females, a lot of lawyers, all people of very strong reputation, very well known. Uh, two school superintendents, four university presidents. Uh, and the chair was Thomas Pearsall, who was a former chairman of the Rocky Mountain School Board, Speaker of the House of Representatives, member of the legislature, an attorney, very good attorney. The committee, and, and I was fortunate, uh, sometimes uh, 
I was fortunate. Sometimes things just happen in your life that create an opportunity that, that it's hard to imagine. I was a protege I admired very much, a man named Dallas Herring. Dallas Herring was chairman of the State Board of Education for 25 years. A brilliant guy. Uh, had degrees in Greek and English and Biblical literature from Davidson, uh, Davidson College. Uh, if you've ever, he owned a casting company. And when you look at a casket, when you've seen the interior of the casket that has that beautiful quilted pattern uh, design, he invented that. He owns the, owns the patent on it. Dallas died uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, but I, I knew Dallas because of some of my writing, because I called him, because I was active as a teacher. And when I talked to Dallas about uh, doing some research about the history of education and about school desegregation. He said, well, you know, I was a member of the Pearsall Committee. I didn't know it when I first talked to him. And he said, you know what? I still got all the correspondence, all the papers from that time. And he said, they're in the state archives, but nobody can see them. And I went to the state archives, and fortunately by this time, I'd had a couple of other books published. That I knew the people uh, in the state archives. They said, well, actually, he didn't tell you the whole story. What's here is the largest private collection of papers in the entire state archives. And not only is it the largest collection, Dallas had a full-time employee whose job was to collate, index, uh, and, and keep track of all of his papers. We don't think he ever threw a page of paper away in his life but nobody can see them. There was a stipulation when he donated them that because they contained some very sensitive material, no one could access this collection until 10 years after his death. But then he said, John, I trust you. I'll amend the agreement. So he sent in a letter to the State Archives, and I became the only person allowed to see the Herring papers. And you just can't believe what I found. Uh, Every letter that came to the members of the Pearsall Committee, uh, all of the records, all of the correspondence. And what I found blew me away because what I found was the committee never met. The committee members had no idea what was going on. Thomas Pearsall was meeting behind the scenes without telling the members of the committee with a couple of other lawyers, members of the state legislature, and the attorney general, and the assistant attorney general, I. Beverly Lake, who was a former law professor at Wake Forest University. And several of the other key people that were involved had been Professor Lake's students at Wake Forest before he became assistant attorney general. And what I found was, uh, this has happened to me several times, research and writing history. You, you reach something, you find something, and you're sitting there and you're looking at it, and it's like, to me, it's like magic. It's like, that's the smoking gun. That explains it. That's how it happened. Uh, it happened to me a couple of times when I was writing the history of the Guilford County Schools. It happened to me when I was writing this book. I found the letter from the senator that said, I am conveying to you model legislation that I picked up from friends in the legislature in Alabama and Mississippi. And here is the way they did it. And I am recommending this legislation to you. And that is the core of the report for the, Pierce, the first Pearsall Committee. And the members of the committee didn't know about it. They'd never seen it. They only met three times. The second time was basically an organizational meeting. The third time they met, Chairman Pearsall handled hands them the report that they'd never seen before. And he said, the governor wants this to be unanimous. Sign here. And the report said, desegregation of the schools cannot be accomplished and should not be attempted. Well, several members of the committee hit the ceiling. In particular, uh, Dr. Seabrook, who was one of the black members, uh, uh, university president, demanded changes and Dallas Herring demanded changes. In fact, Dallas Herring simply got up from the meeting and walked out. 
and refused to sign it. Eventually, Pearsall, after a day and a half of deliberation with the other committee members, revised it enough to get the other committee members to sign it. And the key change was he added the word forthwith. Desegregation of the schools forthwith cannot be attempted and should not, uh, cannot be accomplished and should not be attempted. That was enough to send a message, we'll do it, but we don't know when. We don't know how long this is going to take. So at this point, Chairman Pearsall was able to get signatures of all of the committee members except Dallas Herring. He called Dallas Herring, and Dallas says he put me under a lot of pressure. But finally, Herring agreed to sign in return for a promise that the public schools would not be closed and would be supported. At this point, Herring figured, my public service career is over. You don't cross the governor uh, like that and, and, and last. Six months later, six months later, he was appointed to the, to the State Board of Education. Because in the meantime, Governor Umstead died, and Luther Hodges succeeded him. Luther Hodges deliberated. He didn't, again, the most difficult decision facing a governor since the Civil War uh, at, at the state level. Didn't know what to do. Appointed a new committee. This time, the committee was all lawyers, all white, all male. It came about because Governor Hodges was under so much pressure from members of the General Assembly to not appoint any blacks to a committee, to make it an all white committee, and flat out they said, and I've got, and I've seen the, let, the letters there in the footnotes, uh, if you don't tell us you're going to preserve segregation, by the time this legislature is over, there will be no public school system. And according to one document that was in the Herring Papers, 80% of the members of the General Assembly signed a document stating they would abolish the public school system if segregation were not maintained. Now, what begins to happen is, first of all, legislation is passed shifting pupil assignment authority from the State Board of Education to local boards of education. This is a brilliant legal maneuver because it means that no single lawsuit can produce a decision that has statewide application. It means that every school board in North Carolina had to be sued separately and there were hundreds of them. So again, this was a delaying tactic, admittedly. Uh, that's the reason they did it. And then legislation begins to be developed that provides a long-term solution. In the meantime, Governor Hodges, having filled out Governor Umstead's term, has to run for election on his own. And who does he face? but Assistant Attorney General I Beverly Lake. And Lake's campaign was pure and simple, maintain segregation. Lake spoke to the Ashboro Rotary Club and later to several other civic clubs. And he promoted the idea that what we need to do is transfer the structure of public education from a statewide public school system to individual parent choice where the state appropriates vouchers to each parent and the parent then can use that money to pay for education of their child specifically these are his words in a segregated all-white private academy and that is the legislation that was working its way through now nowadays you hear a lot about vouchers and school choice. And supporters trace the origin of vouchers to uh, a brilliant economist, Milton Friedman, who hypothesized that if education were run on a competitive basis, schools would have to improve, and that private schools are inherently superior to public schools because of the competitive nature. 
That's not where Voucher started. Voucher started as an effort to preserve segregation. Now, I'm not saying Friedman was part of the segregation effort. He wasn't, I'm sure. But that's where it started in North Carolina, and that's where the term vouchers came from. The Patriots of North Carolina was an organization chartered uh, uh, upon proper submission of documents to the Secretary of State as a public corporation. And the mission of the Patriots of North Carolina was to promote cooperation and goodwill between the races in a segregated setting. And when you look at, when I looked at, <clears throat> the names, the signatories, the membership of the Patriots of North Carolina. This is not a redneck movement. This is the elite political, legal leadership of the entire state of North Carolina. The chairs and the presidents of the biggest corporations throughout the state big name lawyers, huge number of members of the state legislature. So there is no question where the position of the elite was, preserve segregation. <clears throat> and the fear of the Hodges administration was that any move to accommodate desegregation would lead to the almost instantaneous abolition of the school system. They were desperately afraid of that. And my point is, they had good reason. Appointed, uh, excuse me, Governor Hodges appointed a second committee, also chaired by Thomas Pearsall, all white, all male. And their report said, here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> First of all, the state should assure parents that no child will ever have to attend an integrated school. We should provide grants to pay for private school tuition, repeal compulsory attendance so that children will not have to go to a desegregated school, amend the Constitution and eliminate the requirement for a public school system, and provide legal assistance to any school system defending a desegregation lawsuit. This is the official position of the state of North Carolina. These are embodied in a constitutional amendment which passed the General Assembly by the requisite two-thirds and went to the people for a popular referendum in 1956. The Constitutional Amendment would authorize that the pop operation of the public schools would be suspended. And suspended means you close all the schools. Totally. If 15% of the voters sign a petition and a majority so votes, Compulsory attendance would be suspended if the schools were closed, and by a turnout, the largest voter turnout in the history of the state, these constitutional amendments were approved by a four to one margin. Every county in the state approved. These constitutional amendments were not supported and promoted by a bunch of rednecks. William Friday, the University of North Carolina president, was one of the keys who helped promote these constitutional amendments. And the reason was the leadership of the state, the moderate leaders of the state, were convinced if they didn't provide a mechanism, something like this, the legislature would close the public school system immediately and there, there wouldn't be anything. Governor Hodges told the people these amendments are a, quote his words, safety valve and publicly stated he hoped they would never be used. But the mechanism was put in place to shut the schools, not save them. In the fall of 1956, superintendents and board chairs in Charlotte, Winston-Salem, and Greensboro met privately to discuss the admission of a few black students. They thought at the time they were the pioneers, they were the biggest, the most prestigious, except for Raleigh, who declined to participate. Uh, and they said, this is something we need to do. There was, throughout this period, at the leadership, moderate leadership level, a constant attention to morality. What's the right thing to do? How would you want your own children to be treated? 
one of the superintendents that I studied made arrangements to teach a Sunday school class uh, in Durham at the, at the largest AME church in Durham. And he took his Sunday school class with him. So at the same time, this strong opposition is hard line across the state. There's a quiet but steady, mainly religious oriented uh, movement that keeps talking about do unto others. How would you want your own child to be treated? What have we been doing all these years? What's right? It's a moral voice that appears. So that's what is driving these three superintendents and board chairs. And there are a few passages in the book where I interviewed some of these people. And if we have time, I'll try to read one to you. To tell you the truth, I have difficulty getting through them. So these three school systems, elite, big city school systems, admitted a small number of middle school and high school students. And of course, you, you know how they were treated. I'm not going to quote what was scrawled on the walls and painted on the sidewalks. The, I have read the hour by hour reports that were phoned in. Remember, there's no such thing as Twitter or internet back in those days. The hour by hour reports from undercover officers, state highway patrol, state bureau of investigation, that was stationed all over these schools to maintain order. And things happened. The kids were treated terribly. There were no incidents that I was able to determine of outright you know, physical violence. None of them were beaten up that I know of. But eggs, tomatoes, spit, ice chips, everything short of severe violence. That happened. But in the background, there are stories repeatedly, I'm going to show you a photograph in a minute or two, where one gang scrawls stuff on the sidewalk and paints the side of the school building, and that afternoon, the principal and the teachers and the student council are out there scrubbing it off. Josephine Boyd, the cover photograph is Josephine Boyd, and I picked her because She's the only one who studied out. And she became the first black student to graduate from a previously all-white high school in North Carolina. And in the back, this is Josephine Boyd, and that's a larger version of the cover photo that I picked for the cover. Um, how, look, look at her. How can anybody be intimidated or threatened by that little girl? And she later commented, I just couldn't understand why they hated me. And there was an incident, you know, I, I lived in Greensboro. I went to Acon Junior High. Uh, my next door neighbor was a student in Greensboro Senior High. She came home every day and told us what happened to Josephine that day. And they threw eggs at her, they threw tomatoes. She'd go home, clean up, take a shower, come back, meet the afternoon classes. She stuck it out. This is a scene from Winston-Salem, Reynolds High School. Uh, in Gwendolyn Bailey in 1957. And this photo from Charlotte Harding High shows Dorothy Counts. And this photo is iconic. This was reproduced all over the world. And when the state archivist, photo archivist, showed this to me, he said, there is a story that we've never been able to verify, but I will share it with you, and, and it's, it's widely regarded as true, that James Baldwin, uh, the great uh, black writer, who was living in exile in Paris, saw this photograph on the front page of the International Herald Tribune and said, I have to go back. But Josephine Boyd is the only one who stuck it out and graduated. Now, just a few examples from the national context. And my point in showing you these, I'm not going to read them to you, but you can flash through them. My point in showing these to you is, to illustrate that during this period, the late 1950s, North Carolina was the only state in the United States, the South, that admitted 
any black students. Now, in the academic press, there's a lot of criticism. It took so long. They admitted so few. Well, there's another way of looking at that. That's true. But another way of looking at it is nobody else did anything at all. North Carolina was the only state that did anything of a positive nature in terms of desegregation. In 1960, Terry Sanford faces I Beverly Lake in the gubernatorial election. Lake, again, uh, race is a central issue. Sanford promoted quality education. Sanford, I was an interview Terry Sanford before he died. Uh, he actually read uh, the portions of this manuscript that I was able to get together before he died and helped me with, with a few things. And he told me I was actually, I was campaigning and a principal, a middle school principal called me up and asked me if I'd stop by and visit. And by this time, Sanford was, he was the heir apparent. He was going to be elected governor. And he said, I went in and I sat down and I talked with the students. And it was like magic. And it affected me so deeply from that point forward. I never made a public appearance in a rally for adults. I only went to schools and I met with children and we invited adults to come as observers. And there is power in that. When he is elected, he sends his own children to a school that was desegregated by the standards of the day, not fully, but by the standards of the day. He promoted quality education, and this is the first major impact in North Carolina education history toward improving the quality of the educational system across the board. So you'll understand how things were progressing or not progressing. In early 1960, 1960s, only 77 black students out of 325,000 were attending formerly all-white schools. This is all that happened as long as desegregation was voluntary and depended on a policy that required black students to apply for transfer, freedom of choice. Chapel Hill Carborough was the first school system in the state that actually adopted a desegregation policy and began to reassign, re redistrict uh, the, the school system in order to actively desegregate every school. And that happened in the early 1960s and nobody else followed suit. A lot of people would say, well, that's what you expect from Chapel Hill, but they were the first, they led the way. 1964 was a critical year for the nation in a lot of ways. The Civil Rights Movement by this time was well underway. Uh, it was a terribly difficult time. And one of the shattering moments in American history comes when President Kennedy is assassinated. Lyndon Baines Johnson, the Vice President from Texas, a Southerner, quote unquote, a lot of people would argue Texas ain't Southern, but he considered himself a Southerner. Uh, decided to make civil rights a focus of his administration. He opposed when he had to run for his own term after filling out President Kennedy's term. He opposed the senator from Arizona, Barry Goldwater. And Barry Goldwater, very strong conservative, but did not want to run on a race-based campaign. So he met with his advisors and he says, how can I get the message across that the federal government won't interfere in the South but not sound like a racist. And his two key advisors, William Rehnquist and Robert Bork, both brilliant attorneys, came up with the strategy, say you're supporting state rights, but you're not making any recommendations based on race. Effect is the same, but he made the claim. And that verbal gymnastic became the public arguing point for a generation. At this point, we have a historic reorientation of the political parties. The Republicans, the Party of Lincoln, the Party of Civil Rights, the Party of the Freedmen's Bureau became the Conservative Party. And the Democrats, the home of the Solid South, the Segregationist Party, became the Liberal Pro-Civil Rights Party, 1964. Lyndon Johnson. Johnson commented to some friends, we gave up the South for 20 years. He underestimated it. In 1964, 
Lake runs again, but he, he's not elected. The two candidates, primary candidates, principal candidates, are Dan K. Moore and uh, L. Richardson Pryor. Pryor is a protege of Sanford. Moore is associated, is associated with the conservative wing of the Democratic Party. And he denounces Sanford and Pryor for accommodating civil rights. Lake endorses Moore. Moore says no promises have been made but six months after he takes office. He appoints I Beverly Lake to the state Supreme Court. The Moore administration supports law and order and does not move forward to promote desegregation. Superintendent, State Superintendent Charles Carroll and Dallas Herring, Dallas told me about this, went to see Governor Moore early on in the administration and they said, we're trying to figure out what to do with the desegregation issue and they talked for about an hour. Governor Moore listened and then when they finished, he said, guess that's your problem and ended the meeting. And that's the end of that. At this point, mid-1960s, the only desegregation that is occurring is when individual black students apply for transfer one at a time. So there has been virtually no desegregation at all by the mid-1960s. And at that point, a series of federal civil rights acts are passed under the initiative of Lyndon Johnson. And it creates a classic carrot and stick approach. He gets Congress to appropriate massive federal dollars to assist with the improvement of schools if they desegregate. The stick being, and if you don't, and if you don't agree, then we'll force you. But you can do it voluntarily, and here's a lot of money to help you. So guess what began to happen? School systems began to apply for federal money, and there is another very important Supreme Court case that's referred to as the Moses Cone Hospital case from Greensboro, North Carolina, where the Supreme Court decided and declared that if you apply for federal money, the federal government can make you abide by any stipulations, any requirements they put on the money. What had been happening was uh, in the South, because it's a hospital case, hospitals had been applying for federal funds but then using the funds to maintain segregated hospitals and not improving black hospitals. So that case came out of North Carolina as well. In the mid-1960s, the Pearsall plan was invalidated in a federal court. A few interesting circumstances. First of all, it was never used. Governor Hodges said it was a safety valve and I hope it will never be used. It was never used. Nobody ever requested that schools be closed. No petition was ever filed to call for a vote. There were a handful of cases where individuals applied for a grant to support tuition in a private school. One was rejected because the private school wasn't accredited. One was rejected because the application was to support tuition to Hargrave Military Academy. The state board says we're not paying for, for any school outside of North Carolina and that's in Virginia. And then the third one is appealed through federal court and the federal court strikes down, rules unconstitutional, the entire Pearsall plan. The irony is the attorney, the U.S. attorney, who was responsible for prosecuting the end of the Pearsall plan, William Medford, was a member of the legislature and was the key uh, whip the guy who got the legislation through the legislature when it was passed. So the very guy who steered it through the General Assembly comes back 15 years later and argues in federal court it's unconstitutional. His argument was, we needed it then, we don't need it now. And it was declared unconstitutional and enforcement was enjoined. Now, one of the side effects throughout this period was as schools begin to actually desegregate, every year you got to run a budget, I'm a former superintendent, and the biggest element of your budget is teacher salaries. So as schools were desegregated, because they weren't running two different school systems, they didn't need as many teachers. 
So they started laying off black teachers. And they started either laying off, demoting, or reassigning black administrators. This leads to, there's a section of the book about lawsuits that were filed, and there's a clear pattern. At the district level, courts tend to uphold, almost always, the school board in these dismissal cases. Then, the NAACP or the NCTA, North Carolina Teachers Association, and I was on the committee that wrote the Constitution for the merged black and white teacher organizations in Guilford County. But the black teacher organization funded a lot of lawsuits in support of their members. On appeal, in every case, in time after time, almost every case, the lower court is overturned because of, one, different standards being applied to white teachers versus black teachers in order to support black dismissals. Or second, the allocation is based on the number of black kids who need this number of black teachers, and the higher court says, you, you can't do that. You don't have a separate school system anymore. When I interviewed some of the key black attorneys who handled these cases, um, they just kind of nodded and gritted their teeth, and Julius Chambers in particular made the comment to me, that's an issue that got away from us. We never saw it coming. But my calculations, and I provide the evidence in the book, showed that although most of the teachers were reinstated, the black principals were devastated. At least 50% of the elementary black principals were reassigned to positions of lesser authority, usually as assistant principals or as teachers. And over 90% of the black high school principals were reassigned. Now that's important not just on an individual basis. It's important because it wiped out one of the key elements of the black leadership class. Latter 1960s, a period of severe unrest on, based on race. The Coleman Report is an important document published in 1966 because the key finding was wherever, first of all, it documented a history of discrimination. But then it showed that wherever black children had been taught in a non-discriminatory standard, they had higher levels of achievement. Family background is the most powerful predictor of academic achievement. But where schools intervene in a constructive way, family background can be overturned. And the Coleman Report became the most important empirical finding and it guided court decisions for a generation. In the election of 1968, Bob Scott becomes the governor. George Wallace, the extreme segregationist, is the runner-up. So this element of strong segregationism has not gone away. It didn't win, but it's still there, and it's a strong minority. And Scott is much more progressive than uh, Dan K. Moore had been. He too enrolled his own children in desegregated schools. The Supreme Court in the meantime hands down two more decisions and these decisions explain all deliberate speed is over. Desegregation must proceed now and the word now is in italics in the, in the decision. This leads to the next series of litigation lawsuits. Well, how far can courts go in order to require desegregation? And that question is answered in 1970 in another North Carolina case, Swan versus Board of Education, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. And that decision, there's a lot of controversy and a lot of history about the decision. Several books have been written just about Swan. The gist of the decision is courts have the authority to order almost anything in order to require desegregation, including busing of students. So at this point, full-scale desegregation becomes the law. And HEW, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, the federal agency that dispenses these funds, uh, 
begins cutting off funding to school systems all over the South. They never cut off any funds to any district in North Carolina. North Carolina, once again, is in the forefront. And the numbers start to change dramatically. Late 1960, 10, 12, 15% of black children are attending desegregated schools. 1970, half are attending desegregated schools. The State Department of Education establishes, uh, uses one of these federal grants to establish a desegregation assistance team. The two guys who are, are the forefront of this team are two guys named Dudley Flood and Gene Cosby. And I'm proud to say these, these were two of my friends. You can't be in a room with those guys and, not, and, and, be, and be mad. You can't do it. They're that good. They can, they can make you talk and understand and see things from another point of view. They're both former principals, and they were just masters. They worked in every district in North Carolina, and they followed some, some guidelines. They met in churches. They never met in schools. They did not meet in government-owned buildings. They laid the groundwork before they held meetings. They had ministers there. They had children there. And the question they always ask is, what can we do to make the education of all children better? The technique that developed in the 1970s was pairing elementary schools, where two schools that had served, for example, grades K through 6, that was the most common pattern then, were paired so that a former black school would have all the kids in that bigger district and they would have grades K through 3, and then the other school would house grades 4 through 6. So that's the most common pattern that was used in order to actually desegregate entire school systems. County school systems found it much easier to desegregate than city school systems. Because if you look at the way people live in the counties, they live all over the place. Whereas in the cities, there were high concentrations of blacks in segregated housing. Whereas in the county, I lived in Guilford County. My next door neighbor was black, a black family. That's the way it was all over rural North Carolina. So it was much easier where the living patterns were mixed than it was in places where the living patterns were highly segregated and concentrated. Throughout this period, they found the, the, the following common elements of success. Strong, positive leadership from the community, the school administrators, especially from, administ from uh, civic leaders who were closely associated with churches and ministers. You find very few ministers who are out there leading civil rights demonstrations, but you do find ministers preaching sermons about do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And the moral voice becomes a key point throughout this period. In 1972, we have the first Republican governor, James Holshouser. And whenever I make this presentation, I say thanks to Jim Holshouser because he kept me in the classroom. I was looking for jobs in those days. I've been teaching uh, about 12 years and I was at the top of the salary scale. I'd been frozen. I could not afford to continue teaching. I got a 30% raise in one year because of Jim Holshouser. And had it been from him, for him, I wouldn't be here today. I'd have been in banking or something, somewhere else. And I'd like to think there are a lot of kids that benefited from me staying in education. And this is the second major initiative in North Carolina history to improve the quality of schools. And it's important to understand that these initiatives impact all children. Wherever you see paired elementary schools, in most cases, especially in county systems, you see new junior highs and high schools being built that cover uh, a desegregated district. Let me ask you a question. Now, I'm from Guilford County, and I tell this story in the book. Give me a year. What year do you think? Now, Guilford County is a progressive, big, well-off county. I didn't do this study for Forsyth County because I wrote the book about Guilford County, so I already knew the answer. What year do you think Guilford County school system 
providing a comprehensive high school for black students. 1968? Never. Neither did Forsyth County, I'll bet you. The only high school education provided to black kids in counties was in union schools that contained all of the grades. They didn't have comprehensive black high schools with science teachers and science labs and the types of facilities and educational access that had existed for a generation or more, multiple generations for white kids. It didn't exist. That's the key point right there. The next thing I was going to say is then when the systems merge, you actually begin to see for the first time in history an entire school system where equal educational opportunity for all kids is the goal. But until the 1970s and 1980s, that goal didn't exist. That's the point. It's exactly where I was headed. Yep. Uh, I began teaching in the fall of 1969, and my first year in the classroom was the second year of a new junior high that had been built to house a newly desegregated and improved facility and a high school that served all children. Until those years, the quality of education for white kids in county systems was drastically inferior to what was provided to all kids, white kids, even black kids, in city systems. So one of the points I'm making and I'm leading up to is desegregation benefited everybody across the board. 1974, mid-1970s, you have the beginnings of retrenchment. Milliken versus Bradley is a key Supreme Court decision decided under the new Chief Justice William Rehnquist, the former advisor to Barry Goldwater, who had argued that the Green decision ordering desegregation now went too far. And so now a majority says we're pulling back the authority of the federal courts and court orders cannot cross district lines. Now what that means, it sounds logical on its face, but what it really means is only southern school systems can be ordered to desegregate, northern school systems can't. You, get, you, get, you see why? Throughout the northeast, you have big city school systems with high concentrations of poverty and race surrounded by high affluent, mostly white school systems. And the Supreme Court says you cannot order those school systems to be broken up and desegregated. So it puts in place de facto segregation approved by law, de facto by custom, not by law, as opposed to de jure, by law. And from that point forward, Retrenchment begins. There is some white flight in the 70s, but not a lot, not enough to materially alter the public school system, although that has, to some extent, changed and is still underway. By the early 1970s, almost all of the black children that had been assigned to all black schools were now attending desegregated schools. Over 90% of North Carolina school systems have been declared unitary, and North Carolina, by 1974, was operating the most thoroughly desegregated school system in the South, and the South was the most thoroughly desegregated school system region in the United States. In the 1980s, the reforms initiated under Governor, first of all, Sanford, but really by Holzhauser, then under Republican Governor Jim Martin, and then expanded under Governor Jim Hunt. And people sometimes say, well, what should we do to improve schools? Facetiously, I say, elect a governor named Jim. <laughs> Here's what they did, and this is about a 20-year period. By this time, I'm a school administrator, so I'm, helping, I'm doing this stuff. Emphasis on early childhood education. Prevent failure in school before it becomes entrenched. Reduce class size, especially for the youngest children. Begin to provide professional development for teachers that's based on quality research. 
if we have time and y'all want to keep listening to me run my mouth, I'll tell you more about that subject because that's what I did when I was with the, the center at Hopkins. Uh, they developed a clearly articulated curriculum, shared it with teachers so that teachers understood what kids were supposed to know and be able to do grade by grade, developed tests that assessed mastery of that curriculum, and provided opportunities for remediation uh, for children who did not show proficiency and require students to be proficient in order to be promoted to the next grade. But change that promotion requirement from a punishment and a retribution to another educational opportunity. And institute an accountability system at the school level rather than at the district level, which is the way it had always been done before, so that every school was looking at its own grade as opposed to looking at an average of the entire district where everybody could say, it's them, not us. Now, it's always us because the accountability is school by school. And the accountability model was based on growth, not, and now I'm going to use a technical term on it, not status. The way that states had always given tests in the past was, you test the 8th graders, you test the 11th graders. And what's wrong with that if you're going to have an accountability model at the school level? The answer is, if you're testing 8th graders every year, they're not the same kids. So there's always going to be score variation. And to the extent that the kids in the 8th grade this year are the same kids that were in the 8th grade last year, they're not pulling your scores up. <laughs> so North Carolina went to test every grade, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and implemented a very statistical, elegant statistical model that measured the growth of the same children from one year to the next. And they discovered some absolutely wonderful things that should be a model for how you improve schools. The impact in summary was North Carolina in the 1990s moved from one of the two or three worst school systems in the United States to the best in the Southeast and above the national average. And I think that's something for all of us to be proud of. The achievement pattern, just as the Coleman Report had predicted, was a strong growth for black children who were taken out of highly discriminatory situations and placed into a situation where the goal was proficiency for all, and low-income white kids and rural white kids who had been disadvantaged for generations. And the pattern of achievement for higher-scoring kids, middle-income, upper-incomes, has changed hardly at all, which is kind of what you, expect, you would expect. If you're at the 90th percentile, how much farther have you got to go? If you got, well, you see my point. So, pretty much constant achievement at the highest levels, significant improvements, such that, and I stopped studying these statistics in 2010, 2012, because that's the latest that they were available. Uh, there is one more ream of data that came out in 2016, 2018, but I'm not ready to make any statements about that yet. I need more than one data point to show change. But as of 2010, 2012, I can state unequivocally that on average throughout the United States, more students were achieving at higher levels across the board than at any time in history, with the lowest dropout rate in history, the best attendance rate in history. And that's a positive change for everybody. Thank you.
County schools, high schools for black students, and for Scythe County, the first graduating class was in 1936. It was Carver. Okay. Carver was a black high school. Was it a county or a city school? County. It was county. county. Okay. There are pockets in North Carolina that I'm aware of that broke the pattern, but the pattern is valid. County systems hardly ever provided any, they, they provided high school education, but not a comprehensive high school. Is the distinction clear? There was no high school for black students prior to that. Yeah. They either, if they could get talk their way into it, they could go to high school in Winston and Atkins, but that was a city school, and it depended on who you knew and what you knew or whatever. And Guilford and, County. And, and, or people would go and stay with other folks in yep. other counties. In Guilford County, the arrangement, the official arrangement up until the 1960s was any child in the county, any black child in the county who wanted to attend high school, uh, a comprehensive high school, Dudley High School, that was the, the high school. The Board of Education would approve the transfer and would pay the city tuition, but the family had to provide their own transportation, so the child had to go live with another family. And I don't and think the site provided tuition. It was just you, right. know, you went and lived with the minister. And family. that's that's the pattern that you find all over, the, all, over the county, yeah. all over the state. The other thing that Guilford County did was there was a very prestigious private school for blacks, uh, Palmer Memorial Institute, and the Guilford County Board of Education would pay tuition to Palmer for any black child that wanted to go uh, and, to Palmer. And Bennett Normal School. Yeah, that, that's right. Uh, Bennett College for What's females, it? black females, had a high school. Before uh, it was college. Yep, yeah. so that was available too. But, but the point is still valid. Throughout the state, hardly any counties ever provided a comprehensive high school for blacks, black kids. Yes, sir. Just, just a quick question. Any thoughts, comments, observations on what's going on now in Winston-Salem where, where segregated schools are re-emerging? Uh, I'd give you some generalities. Uh, I don't want to point fingers at Winston-Salem <clears throat> because I haven't studied, but I know what the pattern is. The pattern is not Forsyth County, Winston-Salem Forsyth. It's nationwide. In the late 1990s, after the Supreme Court decision, Milliken versus Bradley, and that was reinforced later by another Supreme Court decision, a series of federal judges, all of whom were appointed by Ronald Reagan, and if not by Reagan, then by Nixon, returned control of districting to local boards of education and released school systems from poor supervision. When that happened throughout the United States in the late 1990s, local boards of education reinstituted quote unquote neighborhood schools. Neighborhoods are segregated, not by law, by custom. But what they did was adopted the northern model of segregation and put it into the south. So we now have a resegregated school system all over the state. And I'm not ready to say yet what the impact has been on the pattern of academic achievement. I know it improved during desegregation. If it changed, it changed after 2010, and I'm watching the data to see what happens. My personal opinion, looking at what's happening now is that there's an effort underway to create a cheaper school system, not a better school system, and to make political accommodations to a constituency while ignoring everybody else. That's my opinion for what it's worth. You get what you pay for. <laughs> Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, Milton Friedman. Yes. His belief that vouchers and private schools would improve all schools or improve public schools. Has that been proven true? The data is extremely mixed. 
Uh, in my career with the Research Center at Hopkins, one of my jobs was to work with a lot of charter schools, especially in big cities. If I lived in Detroit, I would send my children to one of the charter schools that I worked with, not to a Detroit public school. They were good schools. Not just because I worked with them, but they were good schools. They were almost all, all black. Almost all of the key charter holders, the principal, the owners of the school, were black. Frequently black ministers of big churches. Faculties very mixed. Good teachers, care about kids, good senior administrators, following a moral voice and doing a really good job with those kids across the board and improving academic achievement. That's the ones I worked with in Detroit compared to Detroit schools. The rest of that story is, did they improve the schools in Detroit? No. They're just as bad as they were in the past. So the data about impact of vouchers and charter schools is, depends on which one. And I would argue, and I don't claim to be on a level of Milton Friedman, and you know, this is one of the most brilliant, Nobel Prize winner, most brilliant economists in history, out of my league. But my, my observation is, in any competitive system, the fundamental assumption under com competition is winners and losers. The theory is, if the schools are bad, parents will take kids out. That's not what happens. They don't, they don't know how. They don't, that, that's not what happens. And I personally think you're better off having a better school system across the board than assuming that there need to be losers for children. I think children are too important to relegate to places we know that are destined to be losers. And that can be done. Uh, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but just personal example. As a superintendent, uh, I was superintendent in two of the uh, highest poverty, poorest districts in North Carolina. One was the 25th lowest achieving district, 25th poorest, the other was the 10th poorest. And both of them were among the 12 out of 117 lowest academic achieving districts in the state. Bottom of the barrel. When I went. When I retired, with no additional money, 100% of the schools in my district were rated exemplary on academic achievement. And my district was the largest, highest poverty, highest minority enrollment ever to do that. And without any extra money. What you have to do is stop doing things that are ineffective and replace them with things that are effective. And we know what those things are. I'll take one final sermon preaching moment here and, and comment that what I, what I did with the research center at Hopkins was basically research to disseminate practices based on quality of research. The research is there, but educators are not taught how to evaluate. Educators in general look at research and education with disdain, and they have good reason to because a lot of the research, most of the research in education is bad uh, and is, has rather low standards uh, for, uh, for review. So the, the quality research that's out there in education is very limited, but it does exist. And where it is put in place, results do get better. And that slide I showed you what North Carolina did, that's a whole lot of what it takes and you combine that with highly effective practices in every classroom with every teacher, as opposed to this good teacher adding one discrete better practice to a battery of things that she's always done. She's a good teacher, she cares about kids, and she's learned this one new thing. And by definition, that has marginal incremental impact. That has very little impact on the overall average. Where you get big impact is when every teacher spends every minute of every day in structures that are highly effective. And that takes a lot of professional development and practice. You got time to listen to one other example? 
what I'm talking about. One of my favorite graphs, slides, uh, that I can't show you anymore because it doesn't exist anymore, was an was a image that was on the United States Department of Education website during the Bush administration. And it was a graph of two lines. One is SAT scores, and the other is expenditures for education. And the SAT score line looks like this. Barely discernible improvement over a 30-year period. Little bit more in math than in verbal, but very little. A little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit, you know, almost a flat line. Marginal increase. Graph for expenditures, cost of education. And the interpretation of that graph is, it's obvious, that spending all this extra money doesn't improve academic achievement. All you do is look at those two lines. That's what it says. Here's what the two lines don't say. At the beginning of the SAT score line, who took the SAT? It's voluntary. It's not required. Who took it? The answer is top 5%. In some states, maybe the top 10% of high school graduates. Primarily those who were applying, not primarily, almost exclusively those who were applying to highly selective colleges and universities, such as Ivy League, Duke, Wake Forest, UNC. Nobody else took it. They didn't have to. Why should they? They didn't. Who took the SAT 30 years later in 2010? Two-thirds of the kids in high school. The flat line says 62.5% of the kids in high school in the 2010s and 2012s are achieving at a level that's approximately equal to the top 5 to 10% 30 years ago. So, does that expenditure make any difference? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I just have an anecdotal story. I was in elementary school when Gwendolyn Bailey went to yes. Reynolds. I didn't know her. She didn't have transportation. My parents owned a business, and my father organized different fathers to drive her to school. Wow. They changed cars because people would be targeted. And our car had the name of our business on the door, so he would drive somebody else's car. Uh, so the community organized to try yeah, to get One of the things that I saw in research was the unbelievable level of support that these kids had in the black community. Uh, and we, uh, we didn't know it. Yeah, but everybody was pulling together. And you, you can see that. Um, there's, some, there's some great stories, uh, so some of which I was able to recount in the book. Thank you all so much for attending. I'm honored that anybody would come and listen to me. Uh, if anybody wants a copy of this book, I've got a, uh, one that I can sell and I can order others for you. I apologize, it's expensive. Uh, I don't set the price the publisher does. It's $45, uh, but I can take credit cards. Uh, and if more than one person wants one, I can order them for you, and I'll pay the cost of shipping to mail it to you. And I have some copies of my uh, cookbooks, too, if anybody wants to eat and drink them on the way. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. Wow.